Howdy. 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 Well, let me welcome you all to the afternoon. Uh, this is the final presentations for Aggie's event. We've been concentrating on helping design solutions to problems that we are seeing uh, in warfighters. This is from Special Operations Command as well as Army Futures Command. So these are the things that we've been doing. For those of you online and live, you're going to find that there are going to be 10 different presentations here. Each team has 10 minutes to present and then each judge will have, the judge will have five minutes to answer questions. My, night, my name is Rodney Bame. I'm responsible for engineering entrepreneurship. We're happy to host this event. We've had 60 students concentrating on a multiple different problems and I think you're going to be amazed at what you're able to see here. The judges are all anxious to see what you have been presenting and we're going to ask each of the judges to introduce themselves here in just a second. But um, in the meantime, just everybody settle in. It's the final presentation. I told you on Friday that it was about three hours to today from Friday. Now do you believe me? Yeah, exactly. It was about three hours, so it seems like time passes very, very quickly. We have all been incredibly impressed with what you've been able to accomplish, what you've put together in a very short period of time, and we are very much looking forward to seeing that. So, if I could, I'm going to ask the judges to be able to um, introduce themselves, and as soon as we get that going, we'll start off with our first presentation. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Rob Cantrell uh, from the United States Special Operations Command Science and Technology. Hi, uh, yeah, Kirby Thomas, Army Futures Command. Jay Marquez, US OCOM. Good. Byron Stevens, Texas A&M University. Uh, Johnny Hurtado, Deputy Director of Bush Combat Development Complex. Perfect, thank you very much, we appreciate it. All right, without further ado, let's get started with the first presentation. Teams, as you remind there, there's a timer in the back. As soon as it goes to zero, we will stop. I will make sure that the uh, judges all have five minutes and I'll stop them as well. So with the first presentation, let's, talk, let's hear from Finding the Front. Gentlemen, we are finding the front line and we are here to bring you Gigums. My name is Rachel Marsh. I'm a sophomore civil engineering major. Hi, I'm Sol Barraza. I'm a senior computer engineering major. Hi, I'm Sornal Sager Bhattacharya. I'm a senior computer science major. Hi, I'm Elad Dermer, a senior electrical engineering major. I'm Mazen Ali. I am a senior in mechanical engineering. And I'm Stephen Berenger, a junior in electronic systems engineering technology. Engaging the enemy is only half the battle. First, you must find them. Sending troops in harm's way without knowledge of the current theater environment may incur a price too great to pay. We have developed a solution capable of detecting, identifying, and geolocating enemy command posts. Using this method, we reduce the risk to our soldiers' lives and gain the capability to attack enemy commands from afar. Our algorithm, in conjunction with phased sensor array, can detect and triangulate unusual concentrations of EMS. Outposts of enemy forces generate a very large electromagnetic signature. By tracking these frequencies, we can determine areas of potential enemy positions with high certainty within the base's known area of interest. Our current model is compatible with modern ATAC systems. Incorporating this algorithm into the ATAC system will increase automation and reduce cognitive load on the operator. The operator will not need to stare continuously at a screen, thereby reducing failed distractions in combat. Our product can deliver interpreted geographic information directly to all units in question. With a large enough budget and deployment scope, we can group our data into a geographic heat map of the entire theater. In further phases, this system could be incorporated into DARPA's radio map. If we enhance our current radio monitoring system with the tools to detect the enemy, we can keep our soldiers safe and attack from afar. At that point, we've finished half the battle. So our group needed to develop a solution to be capable of detecting, identifying, and geolocating uh, enemy command posts through their electromagnetic signatures. 
In the modern war zone, enemy command posts are versatile and difficult to locate because of the way they operate and the utilities that they utilize, and they're always mobile. Manned reconnaissance puts soldiers in the line of fire, and current systems are, are expensive and inefficient, along with the amount of time that it takes to process by individuals the intelligence gathered. To develop this solution, we had to come up with five design requirements. The first requirement was to detect a broad range of frequencies on the EMS. The second requirement is to have a lightweight system that is around three to five pounds. The third requirement is to have a modular and easily deployable system in all situations that can be deployed in around two to three minutes. The fourth requirement is to have a system that is integratable with current Intel systems. And then the final requirement is that the system needs to be autonomous. Current methods that the U.S. military uses is a manned reconnaissance. An advantage with that is that there is a reliable human factor, meaning that you can send out troops to places that are not easily accessible to, for ground vehicles, such as crashed buildings. The disadvantages include that the troops are close to the line of fire, and there's also logistical overheads to consider as well. For the RQ-11 Raven, they are easily deployable, but problems with that include low flight ceiling, a range that they don't have of 10 kilometers with their optical sensors. For the RQ-7 Shadow, they have a range of 1,100 kilometers, but they have a high cost per mission and also use optical sensors. We considered three initial designs. The first one was a mobile ground-based radio triangulation setup. Not too much different than what we currently have. Uh, the second idea was a satellite EMF saturation mapping. To basically take a look at the modern civilian patterns of use and look at what's different than that, look for enemies. The third idea was a drone fleet with uh, various antennas and sensor arrays. The solution we decided on is GIGAMS. More of a structure and a system than an individual object. You have to take at least two or more drones at a base station. Uh, each drone is equipped with a phase array, which acts as a large number of sensors to really allow each drone to get a strong direction and to really effectively track where the signal is coming from. Uh, they're modular design, meaning that you can change out which antennas you're using for what you're trying to track. But also, you can take the system and put it on a Humvee, throw a quadcopter, put a Raven, put on whatever. And the autonomous nature of it, with really how it integrates into the existing system of ATAC, really means that it's going to reduce cognitive uh, a little on that, because every second matters on the battlefield. I'm going to see some simulation of uh, the idea behind uh, the system. You can see Humvee launching two of his drones. They're getting further away, getting into an urban area, for example, and they're scanning for some signals that they, they will get. The signal is getting out. The first drone is getting something, it creates a direction line, the second one getting another one. We have the line, with that we're crossing the direction lines, we, tar we get a target and tag it on our system. The, the main idea is that the system is working as a network. We have three different levels. We have the level, the top level, drones. These drones have phased array uh, antennas that we mentioned, it has a software uh, radio. And also, it's really important to understand that we count on expanding the system. So two drones is the minimum. But the more drones we're using, the more targets that we can get, and the more accurate the read that we will have from these drones. The middle level, mobile uh, processing unit. Every uh, company has some Humvee with them. We just go over it. We upgrade it with a set of antennas. It will be able to use some electronic warfare capabilities and also electronic counter countermeasure capabilities. The bottom level, the important part, the operational uh, commander will have all these inputs in his either tablet or some sort of technology of uh, same similarity, and will have the actual real-time image of the battlefield. So what's going on under the hood? Well, our system works in conjunction with existing intelligence. This means that it doesn't solely rely on previous intelligence. It works in conjunction with it. Uh, we can definitely pinpoint uh, potential command posts but in addition to doing that, we can also create an image based on the EMS transmissions around that command post. And we can better ascertain some of the enemy uh, activities going around, uh, around that vicinity apart from just the command post itself, giving us more intel and vital insights into the battlefield. So this entire system is very state of the art. Uh, it's a real-time automated intelligence collection system. So what that means is, uh, there's, there, it, because it's completely automated, there's very little human intervention. And that allows for uh, faster, uh, faster, more reliable uh, systems to exist. Uh, furthermore, uh, soldiers are kept off of the front lines because you know in advance where, where the enemy command posts are and because you know certain information about the enemy traffic and enemy activities, you can uh, 
uh, you can have a first strike uh, that's that that does not allow that does not require the soldier to go uh, up in the front lines. It's also flexible and modular. This means that by using off-the-shelf components, we're able to create a system that's rugged, cheap, and reliable, and we can mount it on pretty much anything, whether that's drones, a Humvee, you name it. So for the cost, in terms of the systems, what we found is that the most commonly used UAV systems is the RQ-11 Raven and the RQ-7 Shadow. But these are incredibly expensive systems just on their own. The drone itself costs about $35,000 for the Raven and approximately $750,000 for a Shadow. Because of how our system is designed to be modular and placed on quadcopters, small utility devices that you can get right off the shelf and attach to, we're looking at a high-end one being approximately $2,200. For the system, the actual neat, the system that runs the uh, UAV and the entire process, a Raven, $250,000, and a Shadow, up to $15 million. Incredibly expensive. For us, because of how our system is designed, because it's modular and flexible, depending on how many drones you have, depending on how many vehicles you decide to upgrade, you're looking at a cost of approximately $55,000, give or take. And the biggest point of, to focus on is the customers. Right now, the RQ Shadow is used mainly by the US Army Brigade. The Raven, the US Army, the Marines, the Air Force, and SOCOM. Our system is capable of being used by every branch of the armed forces and law enforcement. But beyond that, there's capabilities to be used for tracking people who are lost in the woods, tracking people who are um, missing after an accident occurs. There's more application than just for tracking out in, in enemy's uh, surveillance. And for future improvement, control and command expansion. We want to give the ability to allow people, allow branches of the military to, con to join together in using the system. They'll be able to get the same intel and use it and work with it. Further address electronic countermeasures, we want to make sure that our system is the best system on the market and that when something goes down or if somebody tries to mess with our system, it's ready. Optical communication with the ground station, better communication with the ground station, and tracking detected frequencies and locations. If you found the target, you should be able to find them again. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Mine in the front. <laughs> All right, Judge, you'll have five minutes for questions. Go ahead. Thank you very much for your presentation. Is that working? Um, so, quick question for you regarding uh, the use or interaction with existing intelligence. Does that somehow make your effort to find a command post better? Is that how it takes it into account? And if so, how are you actually doing it? How are you using existing intelligence or working with existing intelligence capabilities? So, looking at it from this point of view of having uh, initial intelligence we can tag or already have pre. Uh, zones of interest, it will make our scans way easier. So we can start from these locations because we know some targets of interest are there already or been there. We can kind of track even the, the network around them. Uh, and, and with that, we make everything way more efficient. We can use, we can go without any initial information if it's a completely new battle zone. Uh, always better to go with intelligence from experience, I'm pretty sure, uh, familiar. Um, and that's what we're counting on. Thank you. You, you had talked about the $55,000, basically unit cost for the brains of, of this system. And then and the caveat there was depending on how many systems that you're going to deploy. My understanding would be that $55,000 is what goes on that $2,200 um, UAV and then depending on how many you have, it's basically $57,000 per system. Is that a correct statement for my thinking? Well, it's more like it's $2,200 that we're looking at per drone. And the whole $55,000 approximation cost is based on the entire embedded system 
through the, as we said, the top level, the middle level, and the bottom level. So from the mobile processing unit that the drones will be communicating to, sending the data to, to reach the command post, and the drones themselves. So hooking up the drones with these systems. In general, the 20 to 5,500 would be possibly towards the initial two drones mobile system, but it's a varying number. The, the, our approximations were based off of existing technologies that we know of, that based off of how much those cost. I, I don't see a, uh, I don't see a prototype. What, what's the next, what's your next challenge here for your team going forward? So we, we worked on developing kind of a test bed for many of our ideas here. Uh, we tested the accuracy of GPS. We did stuff like that. We, we tested the use of uh, 3D printers to, to make, our, make our systems, I guess. The next, the next part would be integrating some of these, uh, some of these systems that are, that are more sparse into one more compact uh, product. That's, that's a final part. And for what it's worth, we do have a prototype. You can't really see it up here, but if you look over on that table, you can see our working prototype. Uh, we did a small test, and we actually picked up a local radio station uh, with pretty good directionality. We always need to improve, of course. We made it in two days. But I, I might recommend that next time have it with you. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, that's part of it. Well, that's, that's part it's of the antenna. That's the entire. Oh, okay. <laughs> you have a desk up here, so. If you want it, I'll bring it to you. We're good. Sure. <laughs> no reason not to. All right. I want to spend just a couple seconds explaining it. You have about a minute. Yes, sir. So this was more of our test bed. Uh, this is a battery pack, so we could use it as almost a standalone unit, or as a standalone unit. It has a trans uh, transmitter and a GPS device, and then the antenna here connects up top on a servo. We used a dipole uh, antenna to try to track the uh, direction, and we could locate roughly the, the bearing in which we were receiving an FM frequency that's broadcast locally here in town. And this simulates simulates a singular antenna in a phase array versus having multiple where you could have all of those triangulated by itself and then multiple drones triangulated again. So it, it extrapolates and gets larger. This is just a base set. So we're really using this test bed as a proof of concept. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Finding the prize, very good, very good. All right, the next team is uh, FOD Bot. FOD bot. So if you all come on forward, if you're going to bring your prototype, I've got a, I've got a table up here that you can set it on. As we're transitioning between the teams, a couple of things that I want to remind everybody is that we've had a tremendous. Y'all come on, come on, come on, come on. Here. here. This is Veterans Weekend, and I just wanted to remind everybody that this is Veterans Weekend. So for us to be able to hold this on Veterans Weekend is really an outstanding opportunity. And I'm going to embarrass the veterans for just a second. If y'all wouldn't mind standing up in the room so we can say thank you very much for all your service. So please, veterans, please stand up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for all of your service. Thank you for spending three week, uh, three day weekend with us, and thank you for everything that you have done for us and for our country. So, again, if we can in some small measure help pay this back, we appreciate all the time and effort. So, again, thank you very much for all your service. And with that, I'll turn it over to Fod Bod. Howdy, we're Team Fod Bod. My name is Rebecca, I'm a general engineering major, and I'm the communication expert on this project. Vivian, general engineering, video expert. Noble, mechanical engineering, prototype expert. Sarojit, mechanical engineering, CAD expert. Yamasi, public health major, and I was the business expert for this project. Patrick, mechanical engineering, electronics expert. Now that we've met the team, let's watch a video. On July 25th, 2000, Air France Flight 4590 went down in flames shortly after takeoff, killing over 100 people. 
This was due to the aircraft running over a strip of metal causing a tire to blow out. Nuts, bolts, wire, and sticks are all examples of FOD. FOD is foreign object debris that can damage an aircraft. The cost to repair a FOD damaged engine can exceed $1 million. Between the years 2002 and 2006, FOD cost the U.S. Army $8.5 million or $97,000 per FOD event. To prevent these FOD events, soldiers undergo FOD walks to find and collect debris. This can take hundreds of men and upwards of six hours per person. Soldiers can instead utilize this time to attend to more important tasks. Introducing FOD Lab, an autonomous FOD collector that can effectively eliminate waste. FODBOT is a three-stage collection mechanism. The first stage is a dual rotating brush, followed by a magnetic bar and ending with a powerful vacuum. This unique approach efficiently collects FOD, resolving the issues it causes. Now, what's a three-letter acronym that could be extremely expensive? This is FOD. FOD is foreign object debris. FOD has high financial and human factors that it could cost. The damages that FOD can cost are, can cost upwards to 20% the initial vehicle price. This means that there are valuable hours from man hours that cost valuable man hours that are used to pick up the FOD and potential fatalities that could occur. This leads us to our problem. How can we minimize the amount of man hours that are used to pick up FOD and prevent fatalities while also maximizing the maintenance of the facility? So our five requirements for our FOD bot is that it must pick up small pieces of FOD and if it's larger than six by six by six feet inches, then it will alert a human operator. Our FODBOT is also less than 50 pounds and must operate at least three hours. And in addition, our FODBOT will maintain a travel speed of, of minimum <coughs> of two miles per hour. Our first design for the FODBOT in involves the FODBOT approaching a piece of FOD, stopping, sweeping it onto a piece of scoop, and the scoop will be rotated by a motor and dumping it into a bin. However, this FOD bot wouldn't be plausible because it would require the FOD bot to stop at every piece of FOD. So we devised the second plan. Our second plan involved a FOD bot that is a series of scoops on a conveyor belt that will scoop the FOD into a bin. However, this had a lot of moving parts, so we decided that it would require too much maintenance to upkeep this FOD bot. So this is our final design. We have the prototype placed here. It's also up on the screen. So we have two brushes that uh, operate at a high RPM on these two axles. And as you can see, um, it has a ramp that the objects that are less than six by six by six inches will go up and the bristles will catch it and scoop it into this bin. Also, we have a magnet placed at the back here, kind of towards the center of the device that will pick up any small metal fragments that are magnetic, such as small nuts and bolts that the bristles won't catch. And lastly, we have a powerful vacuum that will be a shock vacuum, so it can pick up nearly anything, uh, any leftover residue that the first two devices don't pick up, such as um, non-magnetic non materials. So let's take a look at the brush in depth. So as you can see, we have two <laughs> brushes operating at a high RPM that will scoop objects into the bin. And so this allows for larger debris to be larger debris to be captured. Next, we have a staggered brush feature. Uh, it's pretty unique in that it decreases the distance between the two axles so that the bristles don't hit each other. And also, it scoop, it's, uh, since the distance is smaller, it has a higher chance of scooping everything into the bin. Next, let's take a look at the magnetic bar. We have a video here demonstrating the powerful magnet that we have. And so it allows for smaller magnetic uh, metals uh, such as nuts and bolts to be picked up. Lastly, we have the powerful vacuum that will pick up the smaller debris that, the, like I said, the other two devices may not pick up to ensure maximum uh, cleanliness. So we have decided on an autonomous model for this thing because 
a lot of manpowers are wasted in collecting FOD. So we have decided on a hub and spoke model. So each uh, Ford bot will be equipped with LiDAR and GPS sensing uh, systems. So when it detects uh, an object, uh, basically what will happen is it will uh, convey the information to the commander. So if uh, Ford bot one sees a construction going on, it will relay this information to commander at which point the command hub will relay the information to all the fault bots so that now the different fault bots don't go around trying to pick up the same construction. Also, at the end of the day, we intend to delete the data found on the fault bot so that if the fault bot gets hacked or compromised in some way, uh, the data does not reach the hands of those it should not reach. So, in the current system, we have used three proximity sensors to detect uh, any uh, objects that are greater than 6 by 6. So as you see, if there are two sensors on the side, if both the sensors are triggered, that shows the object is very wide. And so it should not be picked up by the fault board. If the sensor 3 is triggered, that means the object is too tall. And so again, it should not be picked up by the fault board. In any such event, as you saw, a loud buzzer will go off and a light will go off, uh, requiring human intervention. So once in the final design, once uh, the fault bot detects any such obstacle, it can map that obstacle onto a map so that a uh, 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 human operator can easily go and pick up the system. Like runways are very vast stretches of land, and if you have the coordinates of the obstruction, cleanup becomes much easier. And these are our top three competitors in the market. We have the fault buster sweeper. This one mechanically is a brush, uh, mechanical brush system that uh, attaches to a uh, vehicle. We also have the power bar magnetic strip. This um, picks up uh, metal debris. And we also have the walk behind sweep, super vacuum. Through this table, you can see our competitive advantage. Most of, all of our competitors actually only utilize one element to pick up debris. And they also require more maintenance power. Um, for the uh, pod bot, you, we combine all three of these elements into one product. And we also make it autonomous allowing for more efficiency and it, the price point shows that we have a competitive, a competitive product for the market. And here's our cost analysis. We have an estimated cost of $1,115. Uh, electronics contributes most to our cost because of the sophisticated processes. All right, so whenever humans are involved with something, the, there's a, studies have shown that there's about a 3% error rate. And obviously, when we're um, using multi-million dollar pieces of equipment, planes, this is unacceptable. On the other hand, computers and uh, different chipsets, they, their bread and butter is uh, repetitive, menial tasks, and they can complete it with a very high success rate, uh, greater than any human's capable of. So when we combine <coughs> the autonomy of our system with the uh, three tried and true methods, vacuum, magnet, and uh, sweeper, uh, we believe that we'll have a competitive advantage over anything that on the market. It also saves valuable man hours. Um, so, you know, soldiers are trained to do a lot more than, uh, you know, pick up garbage. So if we can hand that off to a robot, obviously we should. Uh, our future plans would be uh, scaling this for production and uh, scaling it for different industries. Obviously, uh, a uh, commercial airline facility or a private airline facility has different needs than a uh, military facility, but uh, FOD is a universal issue whenever it comes to uh, anything aviation. There's our references and thank you. Thank you, FOD Bot. All right, judges, you get five minutes for questions. All right, so talk about what I'm looking at versus what would, absolutely, what would actually be used on a taxiway or runway. All right, yeah, sure. So obviously, uh, this is just our you know quickly prototype model to just um, show off our uh, features. You know, the vacuum magnet and sweeper. Sure. But uh, if we were to bring this to market, we would uh, scale it to a uh, approximately two foot by two foot uh, square base um, with everything kind of enclosed in a housing. So, uh, you know, and this would obviously change based on 
who the product was designed for. You know, if you need a wider robot to clear airstrips faster, we, you, we could do that, or you just buy more robots, whichever works for the consumer. Uh, from my personal experience of uh, doing FOD walks for 30 years in the Marine Corps, um, I can tell you that uh, that would probably be a nice lifesaver and time saver. I guess my, my question, I got a couple of questions. The first one being everything that we saw, or I think what you're looking at is a 5,000 foot runway with nothing on it and you're going to go clear it. Um, but when you think about a tarmac with uh, 100 airplanes sitting on it, um, I'm almost looking at this as one of these uh, automated vacuum cleaners that go around your house. So how are you going to, you know, avoid those types of things, number one? You don't want your, your, your robot here running into airplanes because that gets really expensive mm -hmm. real fast. So have you thought about how to go about avoiding things on the runway? Uh, definitely. When we scale this up for uh, market production, uh, we definitely invest a lot in software for just kind of sensing that these things and making sure it's not in areas when there's an expected um, aircraft. So, uh, you know, like if it's running down a runway and suddenly, oh, there's an emergency landing. We uh, planned on implementing a, uh, a protocol where it basically just veers off the runway and hunkers down, you know, trying its best not to become a potential projectile. I guess my thing is you had the photo with all those Marines sitting out there and basically they weren't looking at the runway. They're fixing to do their, do their FOD walk of their base area where all their airplanes are at. And you, you can walk in amongst the airplanes as a human being. How are you going to get that to walk in and amongst the airplanes as a robot trying to pick things up without hitting the airplanes? Uh, proximity sensors. So if it detects something of a certain size, you know, obviously an aircraft tire is massive in comparison to uh, these bots, it would make sure to avoid it. Like uh, obstacle avoidance is a, something we'd be uh, heavily implementing in this just because we don't want to be causing those accidents. And also, you know, if it knows it's at a, you know, a uh, high density of aircraft area, you know, like where a bunch are parked, um, it would probably be going slower and it would probably have a slight sweeping motion at where the uh, sensor array is. You know, just so we can assure that it would be avoiding those collisions. And my final question is, have you thought about an expeditionary environment? Uh, runways at fixed bases are great things, but when you deploy to an expeditionary environment, that FOD thing becomes significantly uh, more dangerous. So have you looked at doing something to support expeditionary operations? Uh, we talked briefly about it. However, um, at this point in the project, uh, we don't have the expertise on our team to be able to handle that because obviously when we're in a uh, unfamiliar environment, there's potential for, you know, uh, volatile uh, substances on the sub or on the uh, <coughs> runway and uh, things of that nature. So we'd have to be implementing a far sturdier system. One uh, of the possible features we discussed were adding tracks to dif difficult terrains so it can maneuver better on, on uh, those kind of terrains. <coughs> There's time for one more question. Hey, what's going on, guys? So, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, doing it in austere environments or without range. Could you also possibly turn this into some sort of a, a sensor or a sentry? Like add sensors to it to turn it into a sentry so that you could also use it for, uh, for defense or for uh, security? Definitely. Uh, we were discussing during the creation of this bot um, putting basically RFID scanners. Uh, inside the robot itself. So when it's running down a, you know, an airfield runway, wherever, um, it would be, if it sees people, it would be checking for that RFID, and if they're not, or if it's not present, it would be reporting the location of the uh, unknown person to its uh, command hub, and it would also be alerting operators to that, its presence. Okay, thank you very much, FODBOT. You have to just roll it off. The next team is Soft Spot.
Howdy, my name is Ben Omanero. I'm a chemical engineering senior student. Ready to the president, I'm a molecular biology sophomore. Hi, my name is John Kirko. I am a sophomore mechanical engineer. Howdy, my name is Alexander Gross. I'm a freshman in general engineering. Howdy, I'm Cameron Oaks. I'm a sophomore in general engineering. Howdy, I'm Elise Hackney, and I am a senior mechanical engineer. And we create smart doggles for dogs on the mission. I want you to picture yourself on the battlefield as a military operator on a night mission. You're tasked with tracking a target beyond your line of sight. You send your military war dog with a camera to survey the scene. Suddenly, your dog turns its head. You lose sight of your target. You lose situational awareness. You lose control of the situation. What if there is a way to quickly regain that control? Howdy, we are Team Softspot and we develop smart doggles for military work dogs. With our solution, we help soldiers better see what the canine sees. We do this by recording and sharing the canine perspective with the handler. We set ourselves apart from the current models of doggles by giving you control, better situational awareness, and more convenience. We give you control with a pan tilt camera. This enables the operator to control the angle of inclination and rotation of the camera on command. With SoftSpot, doggles we provide quick, easy, and familiar access by integrating attack. Currently, soldiers on the battlefield utilize the Android Tactical Assault Kit, aka attack, as a handheld and secure mobile device. We will integrate SoftSpot doggles with attack in order to combine our new technology with a proven and reliable technology already at the operator's disposal. Your dog turns its head. You lose control. You pan the camera and regain situational awareness. Mission accomplished. The problem that we are solving is the lack of control that the handler has over the canine's perspective. And how we solve this problem is by providing three things. The full motion video, audio command, and also environmental data. So before we do a design concept generation, we wanted to focus on the requirements that we must meet in our design. So number one, we researched um, current military dogs that are in use, and so the minimum strap diameter that the goggles need to have is 12 inches. We also wanted to include detachable sensor um, housing. That way we can choose our sensors for specific missions. Um, within that, we also wanted to be able to have a camera that has 720 by 480 resolution and all of our devices need to be powered by a CR123 mobile power unit. Within that, we also must use LED light sources on our goggles to be able to provide visibility up to 10 feet. So with those requirements, we were then able to come up with three different design solutions, and the pictures you see here are our base sketches for the design that we actually have shown on the table, which you can see. With our design solutions, we wanted to make sure that it was compact, because after talking with the mentors, we realized that that is a problem <coughs> we need to address, because the dogs are uh, highly active and they could bump into things, so we don't want to clip any of our sources to our camera and our sensors. We also wanted to make sure that all of our devices, like I said before, were power compatible with our uh, CR123 battery. After speaking with SOCOM subject matter experts, we've identified three key functions that we wanted to put into our initial prototype. And the first video that you see there is just representing our ability to have visual display that's both stable and controlled for the, the handler. In the middle, you can actually see the picture of the speaker in the bottom right corner. And it's actually displayed right here. This is supposed to represent our ability to actually show that we can prove um, audio speaker sound that's connected to the handler's microphone via Bluetooth. And the last image over there is actually naked mounts. So we want to create a, dog, dog, a doggle that's essentially uh, modular. So we can actually mount sensors that we wish under, under the modules that exist. So the technological innovations that we have on the new doggles are a movable pan tilt camera that allow the operator not to have a single non-rotational camera on a dog that is very high strung causing you to have a loss in visual communication with the operator. With the pan tilt you were able to control the, the horizontal axis and the vertical axis and the designation where you are looking for the operator to view on the camera. 
With the local camera broadcast, you were able to actually access the camera on a local area network with any smart device, a phone or a laptop or, or a tablet. And as well, it is a lightweight design. Currently, with the materials that we had at the lab, we have a around a five pound goggle design, but due to how this is a prototype, we will obviously continue in the future to minimize the weight due to how weight increases stress on the dog's neck and therefore limits the capabilities of the mission. So the uh, handler needs to be able to talk to the dog. And the way we fix to do that is right now we have a little radio attached to the dog and that radio would connect to the speaker. Uh, so as he said, we can't really tell the dog what to look for. The dog's gonna be in the room. We're using the camera to uh, look for what we need. If the dog's running around in circles and we want to look at something that just passed, we can tell the dog to sit down and then we can pan the camera around and see what exactly it is, which is different than the models currently in use. As well as that, one of the requirements that SOCON gave us was to put LED lighting on it. And so right now we've got, we can use a remote control to dictate whether it's white light or red light, which would provide a lower profile. And you also notice in the video that can be programmed to blink so you can send a remote control SOS signal. One idea we have for a future design is, say we don't do a visible light spectrum, what if we do IR? That way the enemy can't detect the SOS because they don't, we don't want them knowing where we are. But operators with uh, headsets or a helicopter up in the air could see that signal and be able to find us. Now we're gonna dive right into the model they're created based on the application that connects with the dogs itself. Um, it's called situational awareness control. And what essentially we wanted to do, it's a design that's integrated with a currently used uh, common task known as ATAP. Um, it's a very reliable network and it has a very reliable source, which means it won't be, uh, it won't have that pressure from outer source connection. And so it's a very reliable source that connects from application to application. So you don't have that third party interference, which is very integral, especially when missions that are, um, that can be dangerous, especially for output sources. And so one of our main points is geolocation or bird's eye view in order to get a greater grasp of what we're looking for and what we want to accomplish. It's a new way of looking at integration implementations, especially whenever it comes to circumstances that are very limited in terms of perspective. So if we have the initial view of the dog, but we also have an overview just to see um, overall control and implementation. And the dog view itself is important and pertinent for moving forward. A control panel for the camera is set in motion as it was kind of explained. So it can get an array of the model. You also want orientation stabilization, which is important, which is integrated and maximized with this model, and also in the application itself. And it minimizes response time, which is very integral, especially if we have to be in and out, whether it's um, extracting something, finding a bomb, or just the safety of the dog itself. And here we have two uh, databases from our app. So we're gonna have one interface that allows you to take in air quality from the dog and where they're at so that we can prevent our troops from going into an area that might be dangerous to them, such as chemical attacks in Syria, areas with dangerously high levels of carbon dioxide. And we also wanted to be able to monitor the health status of the dog. So it will have sensors and we can monitor like heart rate, temperature, um, so that we can like protect the dog from being exhausted and know when we should take the dog back or if the dog is ready to go out on another mission or if we should let them rest. So in conclusion, with your support and your funding, we will be able to incorporate our design into the government and allow it to be incorporated with the DEA, police canine units, and disaster relief efforts. For example, our device would be very helpful in situations like 9-11 where we're trying to uncover victims and save lives that way. We'll also be able to use our prototype in civilian applications, for example, peanut allergies. If you have a peanut allergy, our dog will be able to sense peanuts and volunteer health organizations in third world countries that might be in very dangerous environments. We'll also be able to modulate our network variability depending on what situation our dog is in. So if we're in a forest, if we're going underground, we might be able to use different Bluetooth versus Wi-Fi, Zigbee, 3GPP, different networks. And then we'll also have a communication alert where if our dog is out of range, it will automatically signal an alert that the dog should return to base so we don't lose the dog even if we've lost connection. So thank you, we hope you share our, our passion for this project and that you agree that it deserves continuing funding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Soft Spot. All right, judges, you have five minutes for questions. So real quick, you, you said five pounds somewhere in that, in that 
in your presentation. Is that five pounds for the entire system, or are we talking, how much weight is on the dog's head? So it's around five pounds due to how that webcam is actually surprisingly dense. It may not look that way because it's so small, but it has a lot of components inside, as well as the stepper motors here, or servos here, as well as the metal plates to represent the modularity. That all combined with the weight of the goggles and as well the Raspberry Pi and this all represent five pounds. Now, the entire system is five pounds, but not all the five pounds are on the dog's head, but the majority of it is. Also, we have a uh, really heavy walkie-talkie on the dog, which is serving as the radio. That's just a functional thing to prove how we can talk to a dog. In reality, that would be integrated probably into the PCB board and a much better property via the app. Given that you have control over the <laughs> Give, hello? Yeah. It's on, it's on. Given that you have control over the you know, pan and tilt camera and so, some of the other sensors, um, what requirement is there uh, that it needs to be on the head? It doesn't have to be on the head. I mean, why couldn't gives... it be on the body and then I may not have to worry about the weight? It gives the best visibility at the same eye side of the dog, but if we could find a way to mount it on the side of the goggles as opposed to maybe on top of their head, that would be a good source. Why not on a saddle? Because the dog's head will bob up and down when it's running. It could block the vision of the camera. Also, if we're having the dog sit down uh, when we want them to sit still so we can look around it, if we have them sitting down, their back's going to be arched there. If it's on the back of the dog, we can't see what's in front of the dog. If it's on the head, which is the highest point of view, we have a 360 degree panning area. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about stabilizing the camera itself? We pan tilt it, but we all know that it's like handing a child mm -hmm. uh, a camera and trying to watch him while he jumps on a bed. Uh, that, that's a problem. What about stabilization? With stabilization, obviously we'd integrate software stabilization so that digital video can be stabilized, but we'd also try to implement uh, gyroscopic stabilization. So that way, as the dog's running, you have a set point that you're focused on, and even as, the, as it goes up and down, you're able to focus on that point with minimal movement. And you can control that with a PID controller. We just didn't have time to model that with, our, with the sources we had. Sure. Mm -hmm. So real quick question. Uh, the, the sensors in the uh, the uh, components uh, break away, they're capable of breaking away, and at the point where they've lost the camera, what, what, how do you get control back of that, I, the, the, the canine? Are there sensors that don't break away? Because I, I foresee a, a dog going under and into many, many things, and potentially breaking things away, which is preferable to hanging the dog up and getting the dog caught. But how do you get control back to get your sensors back? Well, we have a sensor on here that we would implement, which would essentially see, oh, is the connection broken? And then it would emit a sound or a command telling the dog to come back and essentially regroup with the, with the squad of troops and see what is wrong and essentially see what can be done to mitigate those type of situations. And our design would be more compact than what you see here. Um, so hopefully we would be able to reduce the chance of that clipping off and breaking. We'd provide durable sources on the outside. That way it would be hard to like break, you know, the glass or the sensor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, judges. <laughs> the next team is Maintain AR. Howdy, my name is Grant Singleton. I'm a senior computer engineering major. Hi, I'm Rajat, a grad student in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Sai Hussain, senior industrial engineer. 
I'm Rory Gatson, and I'm a ComSci sophomore major. I'm Bryson Lewis, I'm a freshman mechanical engineer. I'm Tyler Bagby, and I'm a sophomore mechanical engineer, and we are Maintain AI. The Marine Corps acknowledges a maintenance issue that caused a deadly military plane crash should have been detected. Fifteen Marines and a sailor died when a KC-130 aircraft broke apart and crashed. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Mechanical failure has caused over 7,000 military vehicle accidents between 2011 and 2017, resulting in the death of more than 150 troops and the serious injury of many more. Total damage costs were upwards of $2 billion. The lack of efficiency and reliability in the current mechanical maintenance system is the main factor in mechanical failure experienced on the battlefield today. Analog and outdated, this paper-based system does not meet the standards to keep our soldiers safe. Slow movement of information leads to errors and eventually equipment failure. At Maintain AR, we have a solution. By designing cloud-based augmented reality applications, we improve the efficiency of the military maintenance system. Our product, tailored to help the military mechanic, works to ensure the system is running effectively and preventive measures are put in place. Maintain AR strives to secure the safety of our troops. Maintain AR. What's the problem? The current military system maintenance the current military maintenance systems are highly inefficient. A lot of pain points, including technical manuals still in paper format, many of them have pages torn out and are completely missing. So when a soldier needs to do a job, it's gone. There's supply chain management issues. Soldiers fill out paperwork to order a part, and a lot of times that paperwork is completely lost, and another week is added to a maintenance schedule that didn't have to be. There's issues with the communication between supervisors and a mechanic. There's many things that a supervisor has to sign off on that a mechanic does, and the mechanic cannot find that supervisor, sometimes all day. I have personally experienced every single one of these pain points as I spent four years in the United States Navy as a mechanic. And I'm here to tell you that the solution that we developed this weekend addresses and solves every single one of the pain points that I dealt with and I wish I had this thing when I was in the military. And here's my challenge to you. As you see us describe what we've built, we have a threefold approach using cloud architecture, ruggedized mobile applications, and augmented reality. We streamline the maintenance process. And my challenge to you is going to be to find something easier to use than what we're about to show you. And I guarantee you that your 10 year old son could do military maintenance. Yeah. With our system, we are going to reduce the maintenance time to repair, reduction in the personal requirement, and then reduction in the maintenance cost by the reduction in the mean time to repair, and the re reduction in the number of personnel. The fourth requirement is like reduction in human errors and the force that normal people have. Like one of my friends said, when a human is walking, there are high chance of 3% error in the system. But with our system, we'll be taking that error to the 0%. The fifth point is we'll be reducing the mean time between successive failure between the equipment. The last and the final point is we'll be improving the lifetime of the individual part of the system as well as the lifetime of the equipment also. So we came up with three innovative and unique design solutions. All three include an app. The first design solution was an app with 3D images of the vehicle. The second design had an app with photo recognition. And the third design, our solution, which includes the app and augmented reality. All find a solution will be accessible by cloud, will be revolutionize the user experience, and then also would be accessible by being paperless. Our application draws information from the cloud, allowing the mechanic to get the information he needs with the push of a button. Both supervisors and mechanics would have portals within the application to perform their respective tasks. The mechanic on his side of the application 
would be able to select the specific piece of equipment that he's, that he's servicing, then he would be able to pull up all relevant information such as manuals for that piece of equipment, as well as uh, maintenance history for that piece of equipment. Then from there, he can check off on his required tasks in, in the order that is asked of him. From, finally, he can cast all of this information into augmented reality. On screen is the prototype AR version, uh, the prototype of the AR we have. In this 3D space, the mechanic can access all of the information that he can access in the app through, uh, through the, the portals. He can also access information that he couldn't access uh, through paper or even on a tablet, like 3D models and 3D instruction sets. I mentioned earlier that one of the pain points is the supervisor and mechanic interaction. This is the view of the supervisor's version of the application. And you can see on the second image, he has a list of all of his personnel, the vehicle they're working on, and a notification if there's something that requires his attention. He can select the maintainer, which will bring up another screen where he can actually tap into live video and watch what the maintainer is doing and help him in real time remotely. He'll also be able to respond to requests such as parts ordering. He can approve them on the spot. Another issue is fault transmission errors. When the mechanic writes a fault down, puts a fault into the application, he has to take a photo. That way the supervisor looks at the photo and approves, yes, this is a rust issue on the chassis and he can approve it or reject it and send it back. So the current methodology, the way our military is working is highly inefficient. It's antique and obsolete. It requires extra number of personnel. The process, if you want to go from one process to another process, will take, we are taking so much of time in that process. And the current method is highly dependent on people who are working in the process. As you can see, the mechanic goes to the supervisor, supervisor to the clerk, clerk to the supply chain manager, and then if he gets a part, then he'll give it to the soldier. With our methodology, we'll be developing a user-friendly app which is going to automatize, automate the entire system and we don't have to rely on individual person. It will reduce the number of people in the clerical side. Also, it will make a user-friendly system for the mechanic who's working. So the data that you can see on the screen is from some of the top industry players that have made research in this particular field by doing augmented reality and making the maintenance system automa automate automation. So as you can see, with the AR reality, we can decrease the reduction in time spent doing the job by 30%. Significant reduction in the number of workers. C cutting the build time by 25%. Reduction in error rate, as I said, one of my friends said, 0, 3% error when, the, when a human is doing a work, there are high chances of getting 3% error. By this system, we'll be taking down to, to effectively to zero. And the fifth point is 40% improvement in the productivity and increased reliability and effectiveness of the military equipment. Currently, there are two companies that have similar technology to what we are using, Uptake and Upskill. Uptake uses uh, cloud-based data to increase maintenance efficiency, and Upskill uses augmented reality to increase maintenance efficiency. However, we're different. We're different because we use both augmented reality and, and a cloud-based data system in our innovative product. Our product is also geared to the internet relative generation, which is the current generation of soldiers joining the military. So next steps that we could take as a team for our solution, um, we see the development of sensors such as heat sensing and sensing leaks in systems such as mechanical systems that will further develop our prescribed maintenance systems um, as well. Our solution entirely is very efficient and very effective, and we believe it can be cross-platform to many different industries, including automotive, aeronautical, and uh, aviation. As well for implementation, on the next slide, uh, we, it, this, this whole process is very easy to implement, as it is as simple as downloading an app. As well, the AR is very easy to teach to the already tech-savvy generation in the soldier the, the soldiers who are already tech savvy. Um, the cost of the $3,000 lenses are very minor as well in relation to the deaths and the total cost of mechanical failures in the system. 
We would love to open up this discussion with you about further implementation, and we are now opening up the field to more questions. Maintain AR, thank you very much. <laughs> Judges, you have five minutes for questions. Is it on here? Can you hear me? All right, so thanks. Uh, my question for you is, uh, what is your plan uh, to, to bridge the gap between the current capability and the massive fleet that we have across every service and what you guys are trying to implement? Understand that that would make life easier, but what about the current system and all of the data and all of the logs and records that are currently on file? Absolutely, so we start with one command. Uh, we start with one squadron, all the data for that squadron is already on servers uh, for that squadron. We turn that server into a cloud and we implement it with one squadron. And from there, we scale it out. And being software, we would develop it from the beginning, highly scalable. But we would start off incrementally. Also, if you're talking about the amount of equipment that's already, that already exists, are, are you saying like how would we input that data into our system? Right. Uh, I was saying, w w our, our plan was basically to set a specific cutoff date for whatever, whichever branch of the military, or w whichever, yeah, whichever branch of the military we're implementing this for. So we set a specific cutoff date that no records before that are being recorded into, into our system. So essentially to wrap that up, the vehicle history would be dated to whenever we start this system. So any data before that, as it could be due to human error that it's not logged correctly, um, will not be in our system. We will start when we start the system, recording that vehicle data for the maintainer and the mechanic to actually use that. So are you going to bring any additional analysis to the information you're collecting through this process? Uh, and will, will you see trends uh, in the data you're collecting through this, such that we can tell the difference between units that have significantly higher uh, op tempo, operational tempo, by say guard or reserve unit. Do you have plans for any of that? Absolutely, this is a discussion we had and we believe that the most innovative part of our solution was mainstreaming these pain points and from there we could scale out and add additional technologies and one of them that we talked about was a smart hangar bay. You have a hangar bay with cameras and infrared sensors that every time a vehicle or aircraft comes in it's getting scanned and checked and also implementing machine, machine and deep learning to f analyze. We'll have tons of data. With this implemented across the fleet, uh, across the military, we'll have tons of data that we can have hay a heyday with and do analyzation with deep learning. Thank you. Okay, judges, thank you very much. Maintain AR. Very good. The next team is AWACKERS. If y'all will come forward. Howdy, we're the uh, AWACKERS group. I'm Everett Wainwright, I'm a fifth year mechanical engineer. I'm Christopher Caney, I'm a fifth year electrical engineering major. I'm Alec Van Sickle, I'm a first year general engineering major. Adam Johnston, I'm a third year aerospace engineer. I'm Jared Williams, I'm a first year materials engineer. Talk, Sergeant Hasler. We need immediate air support. Uh, we need help. We're heading down the ravine towards Chicago. Roger that, Murphy. We need him immediate cast. Lieutenant, I need your 10 digit grid. Please hurry, sir. These are our brothers. Sisters, 
husbands, wives, sons, daughters, fathers, and mothers. People we all care about. What if it had been them in that situation? AWACKERS is a way to help save those service members. With our system, state-of-the-art military drones allow forward operatives to communicate with command in the rear. This readily deployable communication will save thousands of lives. So, the problem we have here, as seen in the video, maintaining long-range communications through rough terrain, over long distances, through breaks in the line of sight for forward operators who are forward deployed. So, our design requirements, we need a range of over 10 clicks to 10 kilometers past these breaks in the line of sight with self-healing nodes. So, if one of them gets knocked down, the system fixes itself and uh, adapts and overcomes. Small team deployable in less than five minutes. Goes up, team goes out, you, uh, does what they need with it, brings it back down. Network node, node placement coordination, does it on its own. You limit uh, operator time, setting it up, you just pop it up and they spread out, do what they need to do. And reliable signal transmission, again, as seen in the video. If you can't make comms, the system pretty useless. So upwards of 99% reliability. This is the group deployment method. It was our first design. So with it, the group that went out would take drones with them. And when they needed to establish communication back with the base, they would put them up. They would go out until they established communication, hover there while they were talking. And then when they were done, they would fly back to the group. But this is not a great method because you need a long battery life on the drone for it to be able to fly out hover there for the time needs to talk and fly back. This system uses fixed wing drones in order to relay communications. Our forward operators would be able to throw these and be able to keep comms for two hours. These fly in a figure eight pattern and can be adjusted if there is a loss in communications. We also developed a hybrid system which uses uh, dual fixed wing drones to create a, an area of connection around the FOB. And then as your squads get outside of that range of communication, they're allowed to deploy uh, smaller quadcopters to extend that range as well as increase your redundancy in the system just to maintain communication that much longer. So the problem with stationary relays is that uh, once they're placed, they're there, and so it requires human intervention if you go outside of communications and the team needs to move in a different location. They also can't survive single node failures without human intervention. With a mobily deployed system of relays, it can self-heal, so when they detect that a node is gone, they can readjust themselves to keep the network health at 100%. And if the team is moving around, that can also be detected and they can readjust themselves to make sure that they're in the proper location at all times. So this is a graphical representation of a couple scenarios with the self-healing algorithm. As soon as a node is detected gone, the other nodes will spread out and maintain that's needed. This is a video representation of our prototype. Um, as you can see here, when it's hard to see there, we'll do a demonstration with this as well. But when the signal is lost, it starts readjusting itself until it regains the signal in the direction that was lost. And once it does regain the signal, uh, it can reposition itself. This is an example of our uh, topographical deployment algorithm we would use. Basically, it analyzes <coughs> from each starting point on the left-hand side, it analyzes the greatest uh, altitude as it goes over so it knows that would be the best point for a, a line of sight to go out for comms. The, well, those are all the red lines from the starting points. The green line as you can see roughly in the middle is the highest elevation line where it would be the most optimal to put these drones. So uh, this algorithm can be retooled based on the projected location or final location of the squad or team that goes out 
and the green line again is the optimal path for the middle. It's the optimal path to put all the drones so you would have a most complete line of sight for comms. So wire solution. Um, the current solution mostly composes of either pre-positioned radio towers or different manned radio units. And we have fixed that using self-healing technology. Um, it, this allows you to keep the network active um, even if one of the nodes should go down, which is better than your radio towers that could be damaged and then take days or weeks to replace versus these drones that if it gets shot down, granted they're kind of expensive, wouldn't be that sort of time frame to replace. We also have the no longer need to have this pre-positioned equipment, either your communication teams or your radio towers. It's all drone based. If you need more, you go get more, um, either at the, the squad level, carrying them in backpacks or larger drones that were, would fit on the back of a Humvee. We have no reliance on satellite communication or availability. That was one of the key concepts that was presented to us in the problem statement. Whether or not you cannot get satellite communication or you're just not that high up on the food chain to get it. You are lowering the risk to your personnel because we don't have to have those four deployed teams to do your maintenance and security on those radio towers or uh, just the communication teams. We also have a much lower risk of equipment loss because again, if it could take weeks if your radio towers are damaged, but it may only take a few hours to get a new drone in the air. Thank you. Paywhackers. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. Hey, good afternoon, gents. Hey, so uh, thanks. Uh, one question I have is I wasn't quite sure on the deployment of the actual drones themselves. Uh, you know, kind of talked, you alluded to that, you know, the they would be finding the, the best altitude level or you know, some sort of uh, place for them to land, I think, to transmit. How would the actual uh, s operators on the ground be deploying these? Would they release them as they're walking or would they go to, you know, kind of talk about that for a second. I wasn't quite clear. They, um, so our system can detect signal loss between the notes um, and then also the, um, uh, receiver that the team would have will detect loss of signal. So along the optimal path as the team is moving out, when they detect that they're getting a lower signal, uh, they'll be alerted. And there, the, I guess the human intervention would be to release the quadcopter. The quadcopter from there will find the higher altitude that's on that optimal path and land itself. It'll stay on the ground um, dirt while it has communications. And if ever loses communications, it'll come up and um, Try, try to regain that line of sight. And that's what the prototype was kind of demonstrating is that it reacts to a loss of signal and then it, it kind of station, uh, becomes stationary once it regains that signal. Okay, thanks. But, but the operators are carrying these on to the target. Yes. The, the quadcopters, yes. We have the fixed, fixed wing drums, which is to establish a, a certain range of communication. The quadcopters they would be carrying with the team. The, our, our hopes w with what we are looking at and, and the range is that if there aren't too many line of sight issues, uh, you would be able to get at least a kilometer or two away before you'd even need the extender. And the extender should be able to extend it in another. And in terms of battery life, you said two hours of playtime? For, for our original design uh, on the fixed wing, um, up to two hours those are we have the redundancy so they can be cycled out as they're being charged we also did explore um, the idea of a tethered drum and um, we could also incorporate solar power if needed to extend that lifetime the quadcopters have less uh, battery power but if they use the optimal path and they're at a high elevation they shouldn't the, they should be passively listening most of the time and therefore not always need to be hovering. But they topped out at about 30 minutes of flight time. Based on the popular commercial, uh, commercial models. 
All right, so, so you said one or two kilometers. Like, what's the general, like, line of sight communications that you would be using to, like, how far out can you get? Or, you know, especially if you have a, that fixed wing aircraft doing figure eights, like, how far would you get? So your basic um, UHF, VHF radio, right, not satellite comms will get you about 18, 20 miles, depending on power. Right, so your basic handheld radio, uh, Sears radio, right? Singard. Singard, excuse me. Radio, uh, up elevated, especially the fixed wing, drone, fixed wing drone, you can get a much further, you know, further range of signaling. You get that full sphere of uh, EM radiation out of it. You could go for, at altitude, it, depending on the power again, it should just be limited by horizon line. You could get 20, 30 clicks out of it, assuming there's not like a mountain in the way. All right, AWACKERS, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here in the audience and also those online, we're going to take about a 10 minute break uh, so everybody can kind of uh, get back together. Right after that, we'll start the last five presentations. And as you'll see, you'll see a tremendous amount of innovation that's been going on here. So we'll see you in about 10 minutes.
apparently it's, uh, they'll, they'll explain it, but apparently it's Latin. It is. Okay. I looked it up yesterday. Okay, good. <laughs> This is Ultra, y'all here? They're practicing again, I guess. You find them? Hmm. Yeah, not the entire team. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the uh, final presentations, the final set of presentations here for Aggies and Vent with uh, Special Operations Command and Army Futures Command. And now the next team is Vicious Ultra. It's a typical day on patrol when suddenly a surprise attack from the enemy Bullets start flying through the air, hitting the ground, whizzing by. You need reinforcements, so you reach for your comms and... Nothing. The enemy continues to attack. Your unit is pinned down. You radio again. Nothing. The fight intensifies. Your unit really needs those reinforcements. You try to radio one last time and... Communication is essential for warfare. Current communication equipment is bulky, complicated to set up, and often requires constant monitoring. Introducing Visus Ultra, the solution to battlefield communication. We use autonomous drones to solve this problem. How does this work? In the briefing room, soldiers input their mission data into our algorithm. Using a balance of different factors, our algorithm determines the optimal placement for our drones. While on the move, soldiers release our communication drones at periodic intervals. Drones will autonomously fly to their assigned spots, land, and then join the network. With multiple drones, our design can be scaled to any distance needed. By using Visus Ultra, we can facilitate robust communication for every soldier on the battlefield. Howdy! Howdy! We are Visus Ultra. My name is Andrew and I'm a junior in mechanical engineering. I'm Hector Garcia. I'm a master's student in biomedical engineering. Hi, my name is Aaron Bidron. I'm a junior aerospace engineer. I'm Vas Mizazic. I'm a sophomore aerospace engineer. I'm Justin Sines. I'm a junior mechanical engineer. All right, so what is the problem we're having? As seen, in the as seen from the video, we have to, we need a durable, autonomous network to maintain tight communication across the rough terrain and large distances. So us, Visus Ultra, has decided to incorporate uh, drones for, to seek the solutions. To break, uh, oh. to assess the problems, we have broken down into five imperative requirements. One being, the design has to determine optimal drone placement. Two, the design should be able to retransmit signals over the distances of more than 10 kilometers. Three, the drones should be able to operate for at least 24 hours. Fourth, the drones create a self-healing network so it can operate even with the loss of 10% of the drones. Lastly, the drones should be able to communicate from one to another for better surrounding awareness. Now I'm going to hand it off to Hector. So our, our team came up with three possible designs. Design number one, uh, the, air, uh, the aerial drones are going to be released by the soldier and then they are going to, uh, the, going to go to the optimal location uh, via an algorithm. Design number two, the aerial drones are going to be released from the central area, so they will have to fly all the way to the, uh, 
uh, determine location via an algorithm. And the design number three, uh, the, we're using land-based drones, and they're going to be deployed by moving convoys. And again, they're, they're going to remain uh, on the area. Now, we analyze these three possible design in scrutiny, and again, we uh, use the, three, the five requirements that we previously mentioned. And using this, uh, what is called pew matrix, uh, design number one came on top, and the deciding factor was uh, long-term battery. Uh, it was, we, we saved enough battery, and the optimal placement of the drones. Now, I will pass it on to Aaron to explain more about the algorithm of design number one. Thank you, Hector. So the algorithm is basically our bread and butter of the design. The way it works is it takes in terrain data as well as the initial path that the operators are planning on taking. This is represented above. From there, we then take into consideration how far the drones can travel on one battery life. Those positions are determined and shown here in red from the path. Once we know where the drones can go, we must now determine where they should go. And this is determined using our algorithm. Some factors that it takes into consideration includes the elevation of the position, its distance from the path, the transmission length for the transmitter or relay, and the, um, the uh, battery life of the drone. Once we know what these positions are, we now have our area of coverage that completely encompasses the path that the operators are taking so that they can have complete communication with their command base. I'll now pass it on to Moss. Thank you. Okay, so what makes our innovation unique? What makes our product unique? First of all, we have this innovative algorithm that, uh, that completely aut automates the entire process from release of the drone's control to retrieval. This takes all the workload that would previously put, be put on the soldier off uh, and allows them to focus on their objective, the mission. This algorithm is also flexible. This allows us to scale the system to either larger or smaller drones and different types of transmission equipment for different missions. Secondly, our system uses self-healing technology where each drone will know the location of other, every other drone in the system by regularly checking on them. And when they notice that one drone is down, they will perform calculations, and figure out the optimal spot to move to, and then re relocate themselves entirely autonomously, allowing communication to be regained. And then finally, our system is long-lasting. So as you see it in this diagram up here, we have employed a retractable solar panel that will be deployed once the drones are sent to the location and landed. And in good-like situations, this solar panel will allow us to transmit and charge the battery simultaneously in theoretically indefinite operation. In less than optimal conditions, we will have an onboard battery that will allow 24 hours of transmission while landed. And one of the biggest benefits of this system is since we land our drones in a designated spot, which is our optimum transmission location, we, we can save a precious battery that we'd otherwise spend on the drones. So I'm gonna hand it off to Justin, and he's gonna talk about the next steps. So for future implement implementation, looking at phase two, uh, we are optimizing our algorithm. So what does that mean? It means that we're basically taking in more input data. So how can we basically evaluating how we can um, place our drones in, uh, in, in a more optimized way um, accounting for multiple factors, more than what we were able to consider in this 48 hours. Uh, we'll also be looking at increasing the autonomy in the deployment, reducing the strain on the uh, soldiers, the, the operators in the field, so that they don't really have to deal as much with the, with the drones. Uh, we're also uh, looking towards uh, doing Android Tactical Assault uh, Kit integration. So this is the standard communication device that, that uh, all soldiers have on the battlefield, and if we are able to integrate this uh, this design into ATAC, then uh, th then we would be able to provide a more mobile and flexible system for our soldiers, so that they wouldn't be so constrained by it. Um, and we'll also be looking at application outside of military use, so areas like um, uh, natural disasters or search and rescue, uh, you know, basically situations where. Uh, where this communication is so crucial but can be lost easily or hard to come by. So, passing it on to Aaron for closing remarks. Thank you, Justin. So we as a team believe in our design. We were, we were able to accomplish this in less than 48 hours. Imagine what we can do in a month's time, six months' time, even a year and, or more. 
the opportunities are out there. And we, we want to make sure that you can be there with us for the next steps. Thank you. Thank you very much. And judges, you have five minutes to uh, have questions. Since these are going to be man portable, how much do you expect this system to weigh? Because my interpretation of this is it's not one that they're going to be carrying. It's going to be multiple units that they're going to be carrying, depending on the distances that they intend to travel. Great question. So as I mentioned in the presentation, the bread and butter of our design is the algorithm. In phase two, we'll be we will take more consideration into the hardware capabilities that are out there for drones, which includes the parts and whether or not how much they weigh, how much, how big we can make the drone. I do also want to mention that uh, currently our algorithm already takes into consideration uh, drone travel length and drone transmission size. So by, um, by changing those values or building drone packages designed for certain values, you can, uh, you can change the amount of drones that you'd actually need for the situation. So say that you, only have room to carry a certain amount, then we can create a drone package that can support that amount. So if, just so I'm straight, we leave, we're on infill, we start launching, we're putting these drones in the air, they land, they provide our communication link, how do we get them back? Do I gotta go back out there and, and retrieve them? I mean, we're, t we're talking about significant uh, distance so so we, we've uh, taken that in consideration so the, because our drones are self-sustainable um, there's multiple ways that, that they could go about doing this uh, but one of the ways that, that we've considered is just by having all of them uh, know the location of, of where they came from where, where the base is and so that they are able to return to base um, we recognize that that might not be the fastest option but it would be possible because of the solar panels um, so if they needed to recharge, they could recharge and then keep traveling. Within a certain distance, because sometimes that fob is, you know, it's a two-hour helicopter ride for me. I mean, a drone would take significant time, correct? Yeah. So, uh, so when... Uh, when is the solution completed? When does one run the algorithm? Uh, so you would run the algorithm be before uh, the operation. So okay. you, you would give it the predicted, predicted path of, yeah. of movement, and it, it would be able to yeah. tell, tell the drones, okay, yeah. this is where you need to be placed. So then that solution gets then uh, communicated to each drone? Yes. Okay, and so what happens if I go on out there and my nominal solution path is not going to work? Now so, what happens? So, so we've taken that into consideration. That, that's part of our phase two, integrating it into ATAC so that soldiers can say, okay, I, I need to switch my path, and the drones will, will now, can, can recognize that switch, and they can calculate new areas where they need to be. So one drone computes that, or uh, who the, computes the, that? The system, so uh, every drone is, is, is linked, okay. and, and so like the, the, the system as a whole can, yeah. can recalculate that path and, and determine. So I'm carrying a computer that computes that solution? Um, not necessarily. Yeah, uh, I'll speak on this. Uh, so not necessarily. So the main the main purpose of the drones are to actually retransmit the signal. All the calculations that the algorithm will be taking place will not be on the drones. That being because, let's say the drone gets captured, we don't want that software being there. So it'll be taking place in a different server of some sorts, which then connects to our system and then transmits basically to the drones where they need to go. So the calculations are happening not on the drones, but off. Help that answer your question. Good question. Okay, judges, thank you very much. This is Ultra. Thank you. The next judges, just a second. You have the clicker?
We don't need a table. Don't forget to I think we're just going to hold it. Are you sure you want to Give them just a second. All right, Team Dar. Howdy, my name is Clara Cliver and I'm a senior industrial engineering major. I'm Joseph McCaskey, junior aerospace engineer. I'm Ignacio Galvan, junior biological and agricultural engineer. Masato Ochoa, general engineering. Allison Godfrey, senior mechanical engineering major. President Trump tweeted out a photo of the hero dog involved in the operation. Hero dog to help take down the leader of ISIS. A dog trained as a warrior, every bit as tough as they are, armed with high-tech weaponry. DOG, or dog operation gear, is technology-driven gear for military working dogs. It exists to make the communication between dog and handler as effective as possible. It helps handlers to better understand their surrounding environment and better control the dog, all while improving the speed of communication. This enables the special operations team to more safely and effectively execute a mission. DOG utilizes a mask and vest design. The mask houses an antenna for wireless connectivity. Two cameras at the front and back to provide a full 360 degree view goggles to protect the dog's eyes, and a speaker for communication with the handler. The vest has secure pockets which hold different environmental sensors, a microphone to pick up the surrounding sound, and a LED light to help the dog see. Within the vest is haptic technology that uses vibrating components to direct the dog. All of these connect to a secure app that the handler is able to view. This allows for the best communication between handler and dog. These military working dogs are impressive, but with DOG, the dogs can be their best. Military working dogs are used to go in front of special operations teams to be the eyes and ears of these units. However, the communication aspect of this is not as, 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 not as great as it can be. There's lags and delays in the speed of communication, and not as much data is being gathered that's possible. This has got to change. When thinking about this problem, we had to come up with the different requirements for this solution. The first being there has to be live data transmission. When you want to know something, you want to know it now. There cannot be a delay in information. Additionally, we have to make sure that all of the equipment has all of the requirements that's needed in the field. This could be an LED light, a camera, sensors, things of that nature. You never want to send a dog out and then all of a sudden you realize it doesn't have what it needs on it. So we had to plan for all of these different scenarios and make sure that every piece of equipment is on our gear. Additionally, this gear has to be lightweight. Dogs do not have an infinite amount of load capacity. They have to be able to take this gear into the field. This gear also needs to be modular. Not every environment that these dogs are going into is gonna be the same. It could be a tropical, it could be a desert. You don't know. So it has to be able to adjust and adapt to these different environments. Additionally, this equipment cannot impair the dog. These dogs are going out to, to fulfill a mission. You have to make sure that this gear is not gonna make them not be able to run as fast, jump as high, bite as hard, et cetera. They have to be able to do their mission. Our platform includes both a helmet element and a vest element. They work in tandem together to gather environmental data and relay the information to the handler. We have the helmet here with this antenna fin with front facing camera and back facing camera. We have the vest which includes haptic vibrational sensors we have LED light and also microphone and speaker as well. This is a third iteration of our design. As the first two were not, were either too ineffective or too complex, and this is a very good compromise of both. So here we see the Android Tactical Assault Kit, or the ATAC. Here we have all the data from the dog being projected into an application for the handler. We have the front view, we have the back view, we have the sensor readings, and we have a little joystick that allows the operator to direct the dog where to go directionally. So the military today uses microphone speaker technology to communicate with the dog, but our research has indicated that has been ineffective because the dog sometimes becomes confused with the microphone because of ambient sounds or some environmental disruptive sounds. And so the microphone 
Another defect about it is that it causes some latency from the handler to the dog. And it's from the microphone to the coding to the speaker that causes that minor delay that could lead to some disruptive disruption in the mission. So we managed to innovate a haptic technology vest into the dog that uses vibration mechanisms in order to coordinate the dog at the at the will of the handler. So as you can see there, the dog has one on each corner. If this, if the vibrations occur on one side, the dog knows to go on the left and vice versa on the right. But we also included that the vibrations on all four sides can go simultaneously to have the dog indicate a start or a go command. But that is not all. The handler could also get the dog back using a pulsing mechanism that is implemented on the vest so the dog can know that it needs to go back to its handler. And if that's not convincing yet, the a university in Israel has actually tested this out, tested it out. That gentleman right there is using the remote to control the dog with that haptic vest with the vibrations. So the handler managed to achieve the dog going to him, having a spinning command, a laying down command, and also going into different directions. So it is clear that the haptic technology is better than vocal commands because it always guarantees promising results for the safety of the handler and the dog. So the reason why we're focusing within this problem is because we talked to a couple of special operation dog handlers and they told, they told us that their main concern was latency. Latency is described as how fast a signal can travel in a millisecond and although that may not seem as big of an issue, it does become an issue when you're making life-threatening decisions and you want your dog back 100% of the time. But that being said, transferring speech to a command to speech takes more time than just sending a binary signal, which is a zero and one, which will allow to turn on the vibration haptic system or turn it off. And this is a visual representation of our modul modularity of our vest. Those are some sensors that could go on the vest, however, the cool thing about this is that the military will not be limited on those sensors. You guys could hook up any type of sensors as long as they have a USB plug-in to the vest that could, that could then transfer that data to, to the antenna. Current doggles include one camera on the front of the goggles. However, with some feedback we realized that the handlers would like to see some more of environment around the dog. Therefore, we have implemented 360 view using two cameras, one on the front of the antenna and one on the back of the antenna to allow for a full 360 degree view. Additionally, we understand that most special operation missions happen at night. Therefore, we will have both infrared and night vision spectrums on these goggles. We conducted a cost and weight breakdown uh, we estimated that the total weight of the DOG will be around 2.5 pounds with the majority of the weight on the back of the dog on the vest. Additionally, we estimated that the cost will be around $1,360. Now this is a rough estimate as once we get more resources and information about the military and what they're using currently, this price will either increase or decrease. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate the problem that we are solving. There is currently communica communication issues between the forward scout dog and its handler. The communication is lagged and insufficient. So addressing the lagged portion, our innovations using binary signals and haptic technology reduce the time between the handler and the dog. Additionally, in the insufficient portion of the problem, we are implementing 360 degree view along with modular sensors, a microphone, LED lights, and a speaker. Using both this, well, addressing the problem of both the lagged um, communication and the insufficient um, understanding of the environment, we are able to allow for a more efficient mission for our soldiers. With you on board, we are able to better enable these dogs to do the best that they possibly can. Are you up for the mission? Thanks, and we can answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Team Dog. Judges, you have five minutes for questions.
quick question on communication. Uh, signals back and forth, distance. Um, is this going to create additional communication requirements on the handler? Uh, what, what have you looked at there? Um, no, sir, because currently we know that the military and other government institutions like NASA use X bandwidth, which is pretty good of a bandwidth when trying to communicate signals. The only problem comes in when trying to communicate too high, sending too big of data packets. Therefore, that's why we implemented the haptic system, which would be a smaller range of sending data packets, which could minimize the latency. So that accounts for the commands, the video coming back. You've got two cameras now. Uh, that accounts for that as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, it looks like y'all have answered all the questions. Thank you very much, Team WWE. All right, the next team is Team IPACS. Thank you very much for not walking off You're with my clicker. <laughs> All right, Team IPEX. Howdy, my name is Andrew Lee. I'm a sophomore general engineering major. Howdy, my name is Kevin Johnson, and I'm a junior aerospace engineer. Howdy, my name is Benjamin McAdams, and I'm a freshman general engineering student. Howdy, I'm Richard Zhang, and I'm a sophomore general engineering student. Howdy, my name is Jesse Phipps, and I'm a junior biomedical engineer. Howdy, my name is Utej, and I'm a graduate student at Department of Civil Engineering. We will begin our presentation with a short video. in our military, and none of those missions that you saw in that video would be possible without intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So at IAPEX, we aim to play a critical role in the, con in the continued success of our nation's military. Before every fire mission takes place, there is always surveillance that's been conducted and data acquisition of situational data. Operators need to collect situational data so they can know what's ahead of them and that data has to be reliable, accurate, and it has to be up to date. So this in turn goes back to how fire missions are successful. Operators need a method of acquiring situational awareness data in a way that expands upon current capability. Now this data is vital to helping other military personnel perform their task at hand in the most safe efficient and effective manner as possible. Given this challenge, we created a list of requirements that we thought would provide a comprehensive solution to this problem. 
So our first thing is ease of use. This device needs to be deployable with one hand in under 30 seconds. The second, the second requirement was that it has to be small. So we, we decided that five by seven by one would be a good starting point and go down from there. The next requirement is it must last for up to two weeks, but no less than one. It must be able to broadcast video, image, audio, RF data, local network traffic, and GPS military grid coordinates with timestamps. It has to be able to terminate itself upon detecting any terminate, uh, tampering or power loss and various other things. It has to be able to automatically determine whether certain data is more valuable than other data based off of con remote configuration. In order to meet these requirements, we considered three possible designs. The first design was a ground rover. This uh, advantages to this design include it would be uh, able to travel into places that an operative could not safely travel. However, it lacks uh, stealth. It also would have a low battery life. And um, the second option we came up with is a sort of scaling robot. It would scale up to locations that would uh, provide a vantage point that operatives would not normally be able to get in the field. However, the disadvantages to this include, again, lack of stealth, but also um, uh, limited versatility. Finally, the design that we chose is a placeable broadcasting unit. This unit can be placed on all kinds of different structures, from civil structures to public transportation, and would pick up and broadcast all kinds of information. Now, the disadvantages to this system is that it is not mobile. So our design implements five different sensors in order to acquire data. One would be a camera, two would be a microphone. It also has a Wi-Fi module and a GPS module, as well as a spiral antenna. Now we also implemented into our design pressure sensors in order to mitigate um, tampering. This all compacts and... Okay. So our current prototype is able to uh, take image readings, uh, video, image, RF signals, and Wi-Fi scanning, and GPS locations. Uh, we met our form factor requirements, and we have successfully streamed video wirelessly, and we have taken RF measurements as well as GPS. Future plans would be incorporating simultaneous transmission of all data points and the implementation of machine vision. What is the innovation that we are bringing to the table? The device that we build is capable of measuring radio frequency data in locations that is not accessible by satellite. We can collect this data along with uh, audio, video, and image files. And one of, our, one of the advantages of our design is it's very deployable. You can just stick it to the back of any transit, you can stick it to the back of any car, and let it do its work. In fact, the device is so deployable that you know the operator can launch a network of these devices and create uh, and, uh, and get surveillance data at a whole new level. And the operator can do all of this without being worried without being worried about losing his uh, cover because the, destroy, uh, the device destroys itself when its identity is discovered. This concludes our presentation. I thank you all for sitting through our presentation. God bless you all. God bless America. Mm -hmm. We now open the floor for everyone. The judges, you have five minutes for questions. Hey, uh, thanks, gentlemen. I have uh, a couple questions. I know that uh, at some point uh, you guys talked about em employing this. Okay, so we can easily put it on something, but like it, it seems a little big and it seems like it would be easily detectable. Can you guys talk about that for a second? Okay. So, yeah, okay. So this is our prototype, so it is a little big. Um, we, were, we were working with what we had, so we used a Linux computer. Sorry, we used like a, a larger computer. Ideally, we would use a much smaller board that's all pre-compiled and encrypted, so it'd, it'd have a much smaller footprint. And the idea with this style is actually to blend in with civil structures. So instead of trying to hide, it looks like something that you might see in an urban environment, like junction boxes or on the sides of uh, public transport, there's often access terminals. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, I guess if you were going to do that, though, you could just get a junction box and put your camera inside it. Yeah. That, or like 
get a small device and put it in the junction box. Regardless, got what you're saying. Um, is there any other camouflage capabilities you guys were talking about at all? Uh, that, that, is, uh, that is what we want to plan on doing in the stage two of the product. Uh, we've tried to look up at research works on uh, shape-shifting materials and things like that, and so that we, uh, it can be of a more generic purpose and not just applicable for the urban environments, but all kinds of environments. And that's what we aim for. You did talk about it's easily impossible, but you didn't really talk about how it was going to, like what was going to be, I mean, you could, it gonna be tape or okay. what? Yeah, good question. So the way, it's, the way we're planning right now is to have magnets and adhesive. So a combination of magnets, if, you're, if there's metal structures that would allow you to deploy it even faster, because you can essentially set it and the magnets will hold it up long enough for the adhesive to set. So real quick, you talked about uh, a significant amount of data coming off of this and broadcasting off of this, and you also could uh, describe being able to configure this remotely. What are the requirements to collect that information uh, remotely? What are the requirements to control that, those devices? Uh, what is, where, how, how close does the operator or uh, folks involved, have to, how close do they have to be to this? So ideally we want the transmissions to occur on lower frequency FM radio. So we're hoping 10 kilometers would be sort of the maximum distance you'd have to be close to it. But there are problems with urban environments where you could have obstructions using FM. So AM could be something we look into to get around this. I'm still a little confused on the employment of this. This is an ISR asset. It almost sounds to me like I got to go put it up, which kind of eliminates the need for the ISR asset because I am it. Um, unless you're sneaking in and putting it up and then waiting to see what happens um, at a predetermined location. Can you expound on the employment of this? That's, to me, that's the only drawback I see right now. Uh, yes, sir. So the employment of this is meant to be quick and easy. So with the operator, all of the data requirements for when it will transmit the data back is pre-configured before you uh, bring it out for your mission. Then all you have to do is uh, prime the adhesive and then press a switch or button and it will start its data collection <coughs> and then transmit when your set parameters have said that you have important data. Um, and the reason why this is better than current methods that we have in place is well, although you have to do, you have to go and you have to place it by hand, once it is there, it will transmit and collect that data for as long as there's battery until it is found so you can get out of the, uh, out of the hostile territory as fast as possible. Okay, judges, thank you very much. <laughs> the next team is Argos United. Argos United. Howdy, I'm Jonas Stites. I'm a freshman in general engineering. Hi, I'm Vrishan Chanu, and I'm a freshman general engineer. Hello, my name is Rafael Evangelista. I'm a freshman general engineer. Howdy, my name is Max Suri. I'm a junior in the ESET program here at Inden. Hi, I'm Nate Martin, another freshman general engineer. And we are Argos Hi. United. On average, a child under the age of five dies of preventable causes in Yemen every 10 minutes. 11-month-old Malika al Khadr, clinging to life, weighing only seven pounds. She's just one of the 17 million Yemenis who aren't getting enough food to survive. 
Current autonomous data gathering systems are inadequate to combat the modern crises facing SOCOM and the Joint Acquisitions Task Force. The devastating civil war in Yemen has created a mass famine throughout the country. The United States has sent food aid to Yemeni civilians, but 2.6 million pounds of this food has been stolen. We lack the adequate autonomous technology to monitor our aid and identify Houthi rebels stealing the shipments. How can U.S. SOCOM gather the data it needs to prevent these thefts and keep track of our shipments of humanitarian aid? SOCOM and JATF need an autonomous data gathering module capable of identifying points of interest and intelligently gathering tactically relevant data without the intervention of a human operator. That's where we at Argus United come in. The Argus device uses four sensor inputs. Wide angle video, zoom imagery, infrared sensing, and a laser microphone. This suit of sensors will generate a decision matrix to command the device to focus on relevant and useful targets without human intervention. ISRs currently are incapable of acquiring accurate data in given scenarios. More specifically, they are not autonomous, meaning that they rely on military personnel and SOCOM personnel to gather the data alongside with them. So our customers right now are seeking a product that can be uh, manually deployed and self-operating and can make its own decisions and acquire the right data. So now we know the problem. For our solution, we set five requirements. The first requirement is that it must have at least three sensors. Through our research, we discovered that the more sensors you have, the more data you can collect, and through the more data, the more uh, robust the decision making of our system becomes. Uh, the second is operation time. We set our operation time to last at least 72 hours. We set it at this limit because most ISRs that are currently being employed by the government have a minimal operation time requirement of 72 hours, so we wanted to match that. Uh, the third is the size. We wanted to keep the volume under 256 uh, cubic inches. This is because we know the device is going to be mainly installed by operatives, and we want it to be able to fit in a backpack, but also be small enough to be easily cam uh, camouflaged in the environment. Uh, the fourth uh, criteria is we wanted to have two axes of movement for the narrow uh, sensors. So when the IR sensors pick up something on the wide field of view, the IR sensor can move the narrow sensor to locate and focus on a point of interest. And the fifth is memory. With all these sensors, we knew that memory might be an issue. So we calculated how much memory the device would need to be operational and gather data for 72 hours. And we came to the conclusion that it would need at least 64 gigabytes to be operable, operable for those 72 hours. And now that we have our criteria, here are the three designs we initially came up with were from. So to approach this uh, problem statement, we decided to create three different solutions. So the first solution is the aerial insertion model module, which is essentially a spike-like figure that is dropped from an airplane or a drone into a designated area. And once it's inserted into the ground, it will deploy a solar panel for longevity a series of sensors and a platform for a small reconnaissance drone to do the surveying around the area. However, we did not choose this because it, this was not applicable in an urban setting. You simply can't just drop a spike into a concrete slab. And so we moved on to our second design, which is a 360 camera disc, which essentially uses a disc-like structure. Think of a frisbee. And we have four different cameras around the perimeter, which allows 360 camera view. And again, this would be dropped by either a drone or an airplane. The downside to this and why we didn't choose it is because the disk size is very small and cannot harbor all the sensors and the cameras that we wanted, as well as the drone uh, acquiring too much attention whenever we're dropping the disk inside. So we came to our final design, which we ended up choosing, is the, which is the modular box unit. This unit, um, what's interesting about it is that it has a very specific static internal design but the outside, the external design is very modular and modifiable, so you can change the outside depending on your situation, whether you're in urban, rural, or you know, depending on the climate and stuff like that. And so within the, this module, you have um, a set of three cameras and a sensor which work cohesively to acquire data. So given this module, we can go ahead and move on to the Argos unit. 
So why Argus? So the Argus module is much more versatile compared to its current capability, and it's much smarter, and it can gather more data and in a more efficient way because it uses infrared sensors and a laser-based microphone. So the sensor input technology is really, um, it, it presents a leg up because the IR sensor is able to detect targets specifically and then use the laser-based microphone to actually gather audio from that particular target. The actual design of the module is uh, a simple cylinder that can be easily modified or installed into any urban setting with a variety of casings that would make it easily camouflageable. What really distinctifies Argus is its sensor suite, which primarily consists of something <coughs> we call PIPs, as well as a wide angle lens for obtaining video, a precise imaging lens with zoom for getting facial recognition data, and a laser microphone. PIPS, or the Passive Infrared Priority System, consists of a gridded network of infrared sensors, which is constructed like the compound eye of an insect. It superimposes a grid over the entire field of view of the device, which can then be used to detect things of interest like people or vehicles, anything that would give off an infrared signature, which would be of interest to the device, and it then activates the other more advanced sensors to zero in on that point, thus um, essentially analyzing data without the necessary high-level computing or machine learning that could consume a lot of power and would really make the device more expensive than it needs to be. The system is entirely autonomous, but is also very efficient. The laser microphone presents several unique benefits over a traditional audio gathering system. It is ideally suited for urban settings because it can focus on a particular point that you want to receive audio from and not receive any of the background noise, honking cars, etc. that you'd expect in an urban setting. Additionally, it's ultraviolet, so it's extremely difficult to detect and it functions over long distances and through barriers like walls. The Argus system is innovative because of its unique combination of sensors that allow for a greater portfolio of data to be obtained, which can then be analyzed and exported as is shown with this graph, as sensors increase, particularly for facial recognition, the more sensors that you have, the easier it is to process that data. As shown in this demonstration clip here. There it goes. As shown in this clip. So the base model will cost about $350, but it will require manual deployment, which does have some human risk. Once a minimal mission has been completed, however, using the Argus module, it will have saved around $1,000 in operator labor costs. If we are given more assets and time <coughs> to develop the Argus module, then we would first intend to develop more combinations of sensors in order to make more educated and intelligent decisions. In addition, we would create a, we would adapt more models of the Argus module that are adapted to different sorts of surroundings, climates, targets, and means of deployment. The we need your funding in order to expand this project and revolutionize the industry to solve humanitarian and military crises throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And judges, you have five minutes for questions. I may have missed it because I was messing with this tablet, but why is it so big? Uh, it's just an initial design. We, we thought it might need to be that big for uh, such components as the zoom lens uh, and the battery longevity in case we needed it to last longer and in case we wanted to incorporate uh, 
actual facial recognition, which requires larger processors and more battery power to operate. Uh, and so you, you, you foresee this being deployed from uh, an aircraft and dropped in an urban area? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, we see this as being mainly deployed. Our initial thoughts were we could use an aerial drop, but we found that uh, could be problematic. Maybe in some, in some circumstances, cases. probably not in an urban area. Yes. You know, stuff falling out of the sky. Um, okay, got it. Gotcha. Thank you. So, so we just, you place this flower pot in different places in an urban environment and, and it collects yeah. data. Is that the idea? Yes. Yes. Uh, the plant, that's just the base shell. We are, uh, the, the modular casing that we we're talking about, it could have different uh, camouflaging cases. Like you could put a case on it to make it look like a lot or a pot, fire plant in the city or a power transformer on a telephone pole. Just modular casing, but the base unit is the same. Hey, I might have missed it too. Did you guys specify uh, operational time? I mean, how, how long can we leave that? Once I go out there and place it, how long before I have to go back and get it? Uh, so it depends on which sensors and equipment you want to have and how large you want the device to be. Because we thought about making it scalable. Like we could have smaller models that last for a short amount of time and larger models that can be out there for months at a time. Right. And then you guys have obviously discussed how to camouflage that. I mean, I can put that in a park and make it look like a mushroom and leave it there forever. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Argus United. And the final presentation for this afternoon is by K9K. They're going to help us understand how we can help to have dogs uh, provide additional su surveillance. And we have a very colorful military dog, well camouflaged, I can see, as it's coming right to the front of the table. Thank you. <laughs> Give the judges just a second. Yeah, of course. Are the judges ready? Howdy, we are K9 Camera. My name is David Webb, I'm a junior uh, business student. My name is Trey McCauley, I'm a senior mechanical engineer. My name is Matthew Kendall, I'm a senior in aerospace engineering. I'm Dr. Tone, I'm a senior mechanical engineering major. <laughs> Stephen Cole Jinzak, I'm an electronic systems engineering technology student. Tanner Reinhardt, I'm a senior in mechatronic, mechatronics engineering technology. And we are K9 Camera. We'll present you a video right now. So our problem at this moment is that there's a limited state of communication between the dog and the handler on the field. And in order to put ourselves in the shoes of our client, we created a list of requirements in order to create the, pro the perfect product to solve their problem. Uh, here my partner Trey will give more information. So the requirements we came up with for this product, first of all we need live video streaming from a dog to its handler 
to enable the handler to have better situational awareness around the dog outside of line of sight from the handler. Second, we need two-way audio from the dog to the handler so the handler can have, again, better situational awareness around the dog outside of audio range, as well as communication from the handler to the dog so the handler can give the dog communications outside of audio range. Next, we need LED lighting um, from the dog to its environment to illuminate its environment so operators around the dog and the dog operating in environments outside of um, normal light conditions would be able to um, illuminate that environment if need be. Next, we know that this dog could be operating in environments unforeseen yet, um, and we need to enable operators to equip that dog for any given mission in any given environment. So we want the prototype that we developed to be adaptable to any mission. But inside of all of this, we know that we cannot hinder the dog's current mission. So we set two priorities. One, we don't want to infringe the muzzle of the dog whatsoever um, and stay away from this area as much as possible. Second, we need to keep as much weight off the head as possible. So we limited that to no more than three pounds on the head for our final product. And finally, we need the handler to be able to pick up this device and learn how to use it very quickly so they can get out and actually apply this in the field. So we set that as a handler needs to be able to pick this up and learn how to use it in less than a 10 minute time frame. So next, Matt is gonna talk about our design process. So we've already identified the need for the, uh, the problem. There is limited communication in the field between the canine and the dog's handler. The need to, we can augment this with uh, modern technology. So we research the, we research the subject, we talk to the SMEs that we've had here all weekend, we use our experience in the military to really get inside the mind of that handler and see if we can identify the best, process, the best product possible. We've looked at three primary designs, uh, a kind of an integral helmet around the dog's head to protect his head, and we can put cameras and whatnot in there. Uh, maybe like a soft cover, like a baseball cap of some kind, we can mount items on, or a strap system, as you see we have here, where we can integrate a proprietary rail of some kind, uh, modularity, and more cameras and whatnot. The whole purpose of this, though, is to work around the handler and the dog. You require no extra training for the animal, and we want you to really create a passive ISR system while the dog completes the current mission, um, no extra training. Matt can talk more about our specific uh, design here. So once we finalized our design and realized that we wanted to go with the soft frame, we started breaking the frame down into its individual components. But the current canine goggle systems that are on the market provide no ballistic protection for the dog itself. If that handler has Z87.1 ANSI certified ballistic protection, we want that dog to have it as well. Moving on from the goggles, once you go up a little bit, built into the frame itself, we have two cameras. We have one low, low light IR camera and one regular overt camera. Alongside either camera, we have uh, sensors of a few LED array, lights, LED array lights. We have an overt white light. We have a, a dimmer red light. And then we have an IR LED light for the low light camera sensor on there as well. Built down right below the goggles on the bottom part, that is the speakers that the handler will give via his location. It will transmit to the dog and he will be able to extend his operational range with the usual audio commands that the dog will receive. So the dog requires no retraining and still receiving those traditional vocal commands from the handler itself. If you go right between the eyes and the back between the ears on the dog, we have a soft strap for the comfort of the dog, but built in there is a proprietary rail very similar to the arc rail system found on the helmets that Silicon is currently fielding. We didn't want to add any other unnecessary sensors permanently besides the camera, the lights, and the two-way audio that is required in the need statement. That is pretty much going to be standard for, for every mission. That rail is going to be adaptable. Any sensor package you need, you can put on there for that current mission. Ounces make pounds, and we want to mitigate the pounds that that dog has to weigh. Moving back from the harness itself, I'm sorry, excuse me, from the headpiece itself, going to the main body harness on there, you'll notice that the big focal point is a security camera, dome-like camera on the, uh, the back of the dog. That camera is primarily facing to the rear of the dog. Once you get that dog inside of a house and he's off leash, it can be very, very hard to control that dog. His small minor movements, if he blows past something, he's going. Once they're in that house, they're conducting a mission with very few commands from the handler. If he goes past the target and that handler misses him on the front, you can catch him with this the camera back here. It actually rotates 360 degrees. He can do whatever he needs to do. If the unfortunate case happened and that dog gets hit, he becomes incapacitated, 
that dog is still acting as a, as a mobile ISR platform for the handler. Stephen will now be able to go into more context of the communication of the sensors. Due to the uh, limitation on the weight for the head, uh, we prioritized our sensors that would be located there. We limited it only to the two-way audio as well as the video and the LED array. All of the sensing data will be passed to our communication signal aggregator located on the back in our uh, sensing pack. This is going to allow all of our sensors to integrate into our system, creating a uh, feed that goes directly into the microcontroller and transmits via our uh, transmitter to the operator in the field. We also have the servo motor that controls the camera that allows the operator to control where he's actually seeing. Next, we have Tanner with our user interface. Thank you. So all of this data is meaningless without a way to, to display it to the handler. So we've customized our initial UI here. Now the whole idea is that it's completely modular and simple because what Trey said earlier, we're trying to be up and running in 10 minutes. So you can't have your handler jacking around with the app and not being able to figure it out. Like I said, this is completely modular. So all of these boxes here, you can take them in and out through the settings. In this current configuration, in the top left, we have the front camera. The bottom, we have the rear camera with where we're able to control the servos. And then um, on the right panel, you can see all of the different customizable options. We have an LED toggle on and off. You can sense um, environmental features like CO2 and VOC, orientation of the dog, um, coordinates, latitude, longitude, and whatever else you might need for that specific mission. Thank you. David, we'll go into future considerations. So moving forward, we'd be looking into implementing emergency service and rescue operations, RFID vital sign monitoring, LoRa transceiver, and LiDAR mapping. On. So as we transition from an engineering perspective onto a business perspective to add funding onto this, I would like to ask you, the judges, allow us to go into phase two and add these expansion sensors we want to add to fully complement our product. Thank you. The floor is open now for questions. Thank you very much. k 9 k all right, judges, you have five minutes for questions. Hey, guys, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, can you go ahead and spin your princess pup there around? <laughs> so, two cameras, yes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. And total weight? Oh, so uh, for the headboard system, for the overall end goal, for the actual uh, unit, not the, the content here, but if we got a working prototype of, a field board prototype, we'd want to keep it less than three pounds. Uh, not just the weight of the unit itself, but the overall design, we were going for as low profile as possible. That dog needs to get his head under a bed, inside of a dresser, in a spider hole, wherever he needs to go. We cannot have his primary objective of sniffing, biting, getting on, t getting on chase, whatever he needs to do. He needs to be able to perform those functions. So I'm going to ask the question, uh, probably could ask it in a few other groups, but the doggles up there, uh, what, do you think that's the best place for a camera uh, or a dog? A, I guess, do you think you're going to keep goggles on a dog and B, if you can, uh, or do you think that's the best place for a camera? So every dog is different. Uh, every dog's going to have a different relationship with this handler. Um, Will a dog like goggles on his head? No. Can you train him to use it? You can uh, through repetition and training through the dog. Um, it may be something you would have to work with, but uh, given the need statement and, and integrating some sort of headborne de uh, sensor devices to improve the communication between the two, uh, it, it's definitely a, a viable option. Great, thanks. And everything we see, everything we see on the back, that would be integrated into the pack. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, K9K. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, that was the final presentation of this afternoon. The judges are now going to have a very difficult opportunity to be able to try to choose between the first, second, and third place team here. We'll do this in a few minutes. 
Uh, those of you in the room teams, we're going to ask you to place all your prototypes on that ca countertop over there. We'll take care of returning the equipment to the EDC as well as holding on to your prototypes. Because I want to remind you that we are engineering entrepreneurship and if some of these ideas I think are possible, well, let's take them forward. And if you want to take them forward, we'll help you do that. You're ready to create a startup? We'll help you do that as well. I also want to let you know that we have a class coming up next semester that's Innovation for Defense. And they'll be tackling some of these kinds of uh, solutions, not only uh, at this uh, in 48 hours, but we're going to take the entire semester to take a look at some uh, need statements and some problems that are going on. So if you're interested in that class, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. We'd be more than happy to do that. So the judges and I are going to retire in a couple of minutes to talk about your projects and try to determine this difficult process of figuring out the first, second, and third place. While we're doing that, I'm going to ask everyone who participated to go to the steps just over by Starbucks. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a group shot over there. So if y'all will do that, we will be there soon. Yeah.
want to welcome everybody back online and thank you very much for paying attention. The judges had an incredibly difficult time. In fact, they had such a difficult time, they twisted my arm into awarding an honorable mention. So I wound up, you know, wound up providing an honorable mention, but I think it's very well deserved. The teams did outstanding. Y'all, the, the progress that you have made from last Friday, and everybody unanimously talked about it, that first briefing on Friday night was pretty rough, ladies and gentlemen. It was pretty rough, all right? But the polish with what you've placed together and put together your presentations and your solutions and focusing on the problem that you've solved is simply outstanding. The innovation that all of you have provided throughout this 48 hours, and let's remind ourselves, this was only 48 hours, is really, really quite impressive. So you need to congratulate yourself on being able to uh, have such a tremendous innovation. So I congratulate you, so thank you very much. For being here. I'd like also to uh, thank all of the mentors. We have a number of our mentors that are sitting around here, and the mentors here were simply outstanding. Everyone was committed, everyone provided you information, everyone provided you context for every one of your problems. So let's give a round of applause to the mentors. <laughs> and the final thing I want to just say before we start announcing the award winners, is that um, I want to let you know that we have a student who's going to be graduating with her master's degree in aerospace engineering uh, in December. She has been with us and done Aggies Invent for numbers of years, and this is her 20th Aggies Invent, and she is now leaving us. So Katie, come on up here. I gotta say that we are where we are largely because of what Katie has been doing in the background. And so it is with a tremendous amount of pride that we send her out into the working world to actually work on the F-35. So she's going to be entering into this industry and we know that we are sending an outstanding student to be able to support you as warfighters. So Katie, thank you so much. All right, you get to help me hand out the honorable mention. <coughs> All right, so for an honorable mention, and the team wins $250. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, um, the money will show up as scholarships in each one of your accounts, and that's how the money's going to show up. All right, for fourth place and uh, uh, an honorable mention, it is Maintain AR. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Outstanding job. I really got something that I think people really are interested in. Congratulations. So let's get together, take a quick photo. Good. Okay, one, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. One, two, three, just a second. One, two, three. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the second place team, we're going to ask, third place team, sorry, that's right, third place team. <laughs> third place team, we're gonna ask um, uh, uh, Dr. Hurtado and uh, Colonel Stebbins to come up and help. And in the third place team, it is K9K. Who wants to check? Congratulations. By the way, I have to have these checks back. They're not cashable. Sorry. <laughs> Take your pictures. I need to have the checks back. You guys get in the middle here. We'll get on the end. There we go. All right. Good. so but then I need it back. <laughs> All right, we're going to ask uh, our, our, our representative Army Futures Command to present the second. 
And the second place team is Team Dog. One final thing on Team Dog, um, both Allison and Clara are graduating in December in about six weeks, and they are also the two people, what, six days? Less than six weeks. Oh man, sorry, less than six weeks. They are also the first two people to receive the Concept Creation and Commercialization Certificate offered by Engineering Entrepreneurship. So they are in the process of being launched into the world knowing and dealing with engineering entrepreneurship. So congratulations on y'all. And the first place team, without further ado, is FODBOT. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the uh, presentation, the final presentation for this Aggies event. Thank you very much for paying attention. Again, my name is Rodney Bain. We are open for business for any one of you who are ready to take this to the next level. Thank you very much. Y'all have a great rest of the evening. Remind you, classes start tomorrow. Please turn in all your prototypes and anything like that. Thank you very much. <laughs>